Good evening. That worked. Uh, I'm Vivek Sarkar from Georgia Tech, and it gives me great pleasure on behalf of all the organizers to welcome you here in Phoenix for FCRC 2019, and to also welcome everyone connected on live stream. Uh, as we all know, and at this point, all our deans, our provosts, our high-tech managers know, uh, our conferences are where you find the cutting edge of computer science research. FCRC was created in 1993 with the idea of having a federated event every three to four years at which major conferences can be co-located. This year, we have a record number of 2,700 participants in 13 major conferences and many related workshops and tutorials. Uh, that was about 20% more than what we had planned for. Actually, on that note, if your cell phone rings this evening, that's 2,700 people who will remember you for the rest of your career, including everyone on live stream. Uh, let me take a moment to read out the names of all the conferences to remind you who all are here. So we have Colt, E-Energy, EC, HPDC, ICS, ISCA, ISMM, IWQOS, LCTES, PLDI, Sigmetrix, SPA, and STOCK. These conferences cover, as you know, a wide range of foundational areas of computer science research, including computer architecture, economics and computation, embedded systems, high performance and supercomputing, machine learning theory, measurement and modeling, uh, compilers and uh, programming languages, memory management, parallel algorithms, quality of service, smart energy systems, theory of computing, and many related topics. Um, I'm especially pleased from an attendance perspective that we also have a record number of over 1,100 students attending this year. I'd like to encourage everyone, especially the students, to take advantage of the unique opportunity offered by FCRC to attend sessions and conferences outside your research area as well, so you can be exposed to emerging ideas in other fields of computer science. Just check out the Hoover app or the online schedule to see what's going on in the co-located events. Now, a major highlight of FCRC is the opportunity for you to hear plenary talks by eminent leaders from different areas of computer science, starting, of course, uh, with today evening's Turing Lecture by Jeff Hinton and Jan LeCun. All plenary talks will be held in this beautiful Symphony Hall space. Uh, during next week, the talks are scheduled at 11.20 in the morning each day with no conflicting events, so be sure to attend. You have no excuse for missing them. Uh, as a reminder, the plenary speakers next week are Jim Smith, Cynthia Dwok, Sri Ram Krishnamurthy, Jeanette Wing, and Eric Lindahl, and they will all be introduced by Mary Hall, the plenary speaker chair for FCRC. Uh, though I'll have the opportunity to give a more comprehensive round of thanks to everyone at the end of the conference on Friday, I'd like to definitely express my deepest appreciation to the sponsors of all conferences, and especially the sponsors listed here for FCRC as a whole. Uh, this is a unique once in four years event, and that's just not possible without the companies listed here stepping up to support FCRC, so thanks to all of them. Also, the entire ACM team has been working hard to make sure that this entire week is a success, and I'd like to especially thank Donna Capo for her tireless leadership of the conference administration team. Donna has been involved uh, with organizing FCRC since its first instance in 1993 and is absolutely vital to the success of FCRC, so thank you, Donna. Yeah. And finally, thanks to all of you for coming to Phoenix for FCRC and for filling this room. Uh, I hope you have a great conference and enjoy the numerous interactions with all your CS research colleagues. And with that, I would like to invite Sherry Pancake, president of ACM, to the stage to introduce the Turing Lecture. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. I'm delighted to be here at FCRC. As Vivek mentioned, I have the honor of being president of ACM, the world's largest society for computing professionals. Did you know that ACM has almost 100,000 members around the globe? We serve the computing community in 190 countries with our conferences like these, our publications, webinars, and learning resources. ACM is also very active in computing education and curriculum guidelines around the world. It's particularly great to be here at FCRC because of the reasons that Vivek mentioned. What a unique opportunity it is. We all know that computing has become much more interdisciplinary, but it's not often that we have the chance to meet and interact with leading researchers from other areas outside our own. I really encourage you to take advantage of that this week. As all of us know, AI is the most rapidly growing area in all the sciences and certainly a hot topic in society at large. The incredible advances that we've been seeing in AI would not have been possible without some of the foundations let, that were established by people like those we're honoring tonight. For example, when we think about impact, think about the research that went into development of GPUs originally in the gaming industry. Who would have imagined at that point that later they would be assembled into large arrays and used as a platform for vast neural networks that in turn have driven just leapfrog advances in fields like robotics and computer vision. The kinds of advances that we're recognizing tonight are those generally in the area of deep learning. Billions of people around the world benefit from the machine learning advantages. Anybody with a smartphone has access to just amazing advances in things like computer vision and speech recognition that we never even dreamed of just a few years ago. Even more importantly, perhaps, machine learning has been giving scientists new tools that are allowing them to make advances in fields from medicine to astronomy and material science. FCRC only happens every four years, so when we talked about this session, we wanted to do something special for the welcome session. I think you'll agree with me that hearing from this year's laureates of the Turing Prize is the way to make it really special. The 2018 ACM AM Turing Award was presented just last week in San Francisco to three pioneers of deep learning. Yashua Benjo, Jeffrey Hinton, and Jan LeCun. The three of them, collectively and independently, worked over a 30-year period to develop, first of all, the conceptual foundations for deep neural networks, and then performed experimentation that ended up identifying a lot of very interesting phenomena. But they didn't stop there. They went on to develop engineering advances that demonstrated conclusively that deep neural nets could actually be applied in practice and in an economic way. This, in turn, allowed other people to develop these amazing concepts that we are now and advances that we are now benefiting from in so many different areas, computer vision, speech recognition, natural language processing, robotics, so many different other areas. So it is with great pleasure that I am able to introduce tonight's speakers. The first is Jeff Hinton, who will be giving his Turing lecture on the topic, The Digital Learning Revolution. He will be followed by Jan LeCun, who very fittingly has called his talk The Deep Learning Revolution, the sequel. So, Jeffrey, I'd like to welcome you. Thank you. 
I'd first like to thank all the people at ACM who devote their time to making all of this run smoothly. So, there have been two paradigms for AI. Um, since the 1950s, there's been the logic-inspired approach where the essence of intelligence is seen as symbolic expressions operated on by symbolic rules, and the main problem has been reasoning. How do we get a computer to do reasoning like people do? And there's been the biologically-inspired approach, which is very different. Um, it sees the essence of intelligence as learning the connection strengths of the neural network, and the main things to focus on, at least to begin with, are learning and perception. So they're very different paradigms with very different initial goals. They have very different views of the internal representations that should be used. So the symbolic paradigm thinks that um, you should use symbolic expressions, and you can give these to the computer if you invent a good language to express them in. And you can, of course, get new expressions within the computer by applying rules. The biological paradigm thinks the internal representations are nothing at all like language. They're just big vectors of neural activity. And these big vectors have causal effects on other big vectors. And these vectors are going to be learned from data. So all the structure in these vectors is going to be learned from data. I'm obviously giving sort of caricatures of the two positions to emphasize how different they are. They lead to two very different ways of trying to get a computer to do what you want. So um, one method, which I slightly naughtily call intelligent design, is what you would call programming. Um, it's you figure out how to solve the problem, and then you tell the computer exactly what to do. The other method is you just show the computer a lot of examples of inputs and the outputs it should produce, and you let the computer figure it out. Of course, you have to program the computer there too, but it's programmed once with some general purpose learning algorithm. That again is a simplification. So an example of a kind of thing that people spent 50 years trying to do with symbolic AI is take an image and describe what's in the image. So think about taking the millions of pixels in the image on the left and converting them to a string of words. It's not obvious how you'd write that program. People tried for a long time and they couldn't write that program. Um, people doing neural nets also tried for a long time. And in the end, they managed to get a system that worked quite well, which was based on the pure learning approach. So the central question for neural nets was always, we know that big neural nets with lots of layers and nonlinear processing elements can compute complicated things, at least we believe they can. Um, but the question is, can they learn to do it? So can you learn a task like object recognition or machine translation by taking a big net and starting from random weights and somehow training it so it changes the weights, so it changes what it computes? There's an obvious learning algorithm for such systems, which was proposed by Turing and by Selfridge and by many other people, variations of it. And the idea is you start with random weights. So this is how Turing believed human intelligence works. You start with random weights, and rewards and punishments cause you to change the connection strengths so you eventually learn stuff. Um, this is extremely inefficient. It will work, but it's extremely inefficient. In the 1960s, Rosenblatt introduced a fairly simple and efficient learning procedure, much more efficient than random trial and error, that could figure out how to learn the weights on features in which you extract features from the image and then you combine the features using weights to make a decision. And he managed to show you can do some things like that, some moderately impressive things. But the, the, in perceptrons, you don't learn the features. That, again, is a simplification. Rosenblatt had all sorts of ideas about how you would learn the features, but he didn't invent backpropagation. In 1969, Minsky and Papert showed that the kinds of perceptrons that Rosenblatt had got to work were very limited in what they could do. There were some fairly simple things they were unable to do. And Minsky and Papert strongly implied that making them deeper wouldn't help and better learning algorithms wouldn't help. That it was a basic limitation of this way of doing things. Um, and that led to the first neural net winter. 
In the 1970s and the 1980s, many different groups invented the backpropagation algorithm, variations of it, um, and backpropagation allows a neural network to learn the feature detectors and to have multiple layers of learned feature detectors. That created a lot of excitement. It allowed neural networks, for example, to convert words into vectors that represented the meanings of the words, and they could do that just by trying to predict the next word. And it looked as if it might be able to solve tough problems like speech recognition and shape recognition. And indeed, it did solve, it did do moderately well at speech recognition, and for some forms of shape recognition it did very well, like Jan Lacan's networks that read handwriting. But um, what I'm going to do now is explain very briefly how neural networks work. I know most of you will know this, but I just want to go over it just in case. Um, so we make a gross idealization of a neuron, and the aim of this idealization is to get something that can learn so that we can study how you put all these things together to learn something complicated in big networks of these things. So it has some incoming weights that you can vary, or the learning algorithm will vary, and it gives an output that's just equal to its input, provided the input's over a certain amount. So it's a that's a rectified linear neuron, which we actually didn't start using till later, but these are the kinds of neurons that work very well. And then you hook them up into a network, and you have weights on the incoming weights for each of these neurons. And as you change those incoming weights, you're changing what feature that neuron will respond to. So by learning these weights, you're learning the features. You put in a few hidden layers, and then you'd like to train it so that the output neurons do what you like. So for example, we might show it images of dogs and cats. And we might like the left neuron to turn on for a dog and the right one for a cat. And the question is, how are we going to train it? So there's two kinds of learning algorithms, mainly. Oh, there's th actually three, but the third one doesn't work very well. That's called reinforcement learning. Um, <laughs> there's a wonderful reductio ad absurdum of reinforcement learning called DeepMind. Um, so that was a joke. There's um, supervised training, where you show the network what the output ought to be, and you adjust the weights until it produces the output you want. And for that, you need to know what the output ought to be. And there's unsupervised learning, where you take some data, and you try and represent that data in the hidden layers in such a way that you can reconstruct the data, or perhaps reconstruct parts of the data. If I blank out small parts of the data, can I reconstruct them now from the hidden layers? That's, that's the way unsupervised learning typically works in neural nets. So here's a really inefficient way to do supervised learning by using a mutation or reinforcement kind of method. What you would do is you take your neural net, you give it some, a typical set of examples, you'd see how well it did, you then take one weight and you change that weight slightly and you'd see if the neural net does better or worse. If it does better, you keep that change. If it does worse, um, you'd throw it away. Perhaps you're changing the opposite direction and that's already a factor of two improvement. Um, but this is an incredibly slow learning algorithm. It will work, but what it achieves can be achieved many, many times faster by backpropagation. So you can think of backpropagation as just an efficient version of this algorithm. So in backpropagation, instead of changing a weight and measuring what effect that has on the performance of the network, what you do is you use the fact that all of the weights of the network are inside the computer, you use that fact to compute what the effect of a weight change would be on the performance, and you do that for all of the weights in parallel. So if you have a million weights, you can compute for all of them in parallel what the effect of a small change in that weight would be on the performance, and then you can update them all in parallel. That has its own problems, but it'll go a million times faster than the previous algorithm. Um, many people in the press describe that as an exponential speed up. Actually, it's a linear speed up. Um, the term exponentially is used quadratically too often. <laughs> so um, we get to backpropagation, where you do a forward pass through the net, you look to see what the outputs are, and then using the difference between what you got and what you wanted, you do a backwards pass, which has much the same flavor as the forward pass. It's just high school calculus, or maybe first university year calculus. And um, 
you can now compute in parallel which direction you should change each weight in. And then very surprisingly, you don't have to do that for the whole training set. You just take a small batch of examples, and on that batch of examples, you compute how to change the connection strengths. And you might have got it wrong because of the quirks of that batch of examples, but you change them anyway, and then you take another batch of examples. This is called stochastic gradient descent. And I guess the major discovery of, of the neural net community is that stochastic gradient descent, even though it has no real right to work, actually works really well. And, but it works really well at scale. If you give it lots of data and big nets, it really shows, shows its colors. However, um, in the 1980s, we were very, very pleased by backpropagation. It seemed to have solved the problem, and we were convinced it was going to um, solve everything. And it did actually do quite well at speech recognition and some forms of object recognition, but it was basically a disappointment. It didn't work nearly as well as we thought. And the real issue was why. And at the time, people had all sorts of analyses of why it didn't work, most of which were wrong. So they said, it's getting trapped in local optima. We now know that wasn't the problem. Um, when other learning algorithms worked better than backpropagation on modest sized data sets, um, most people in the machine learning community adopted the view that what you guys are trying to do is learn these deep multi-layer networks from random weights just using stochastic gradient descent. And this is crazy. Um, it's never going to work. You're just asking for too much. There's no way you're going to get systems like this to work unless you put in quite a lot of hand engineering. Um, you somehow wire in some prior knowledge. So linguists, for example, have been indoctrinated to believe that a lot of language is innate, and you'd never learn language without prior knowledge. In fact, they had mathematical theorems that proved you couldn't learn language without prior knowledge. Um, my response to that is beware of mathematicians bearing theorems. So I just want to give you some really silly theories. I, I'm a Monty Python fan. So here's some really silly theories. Um, the continents used to be connected and then drifted apart. And you can imagine how silly geologists thought that theory was. Um, great big neural nets that start with random weights and no prior knowledge can learn to do machine translation. That seemed like a very, very silly theory to many people. Um, just to add one more, if you take a natural remedy and you keep diluting it, the more you dilute it, the more potent it gets. And some people believe that too. Um, so the quote at the top was taken actually from the continental drift literature. Um, Wegener, who suggested in 1912, was kind of laughed out of town, even though he actually had very good arguments. Um, he didn't have a good mechanism. And the geological community said, you know, we've got to keep this stuff out of the textbooks and out of the journals. It's just going to confuse people. Um, we had our own little experience of that in the second neural net winter. Um, so NIPS, of all conferences, um, declined to take a paper of mine. Um, you don't forget those things. And, <laughs> and um, like many other disappointed authors, I had a word with a friend on the program committee. And my friend on the program committee told me, well, you see, they couldn't accept this because they had two papers on deep learning, and they had to decide which one to accept. And they had actually accepted the other one. So they couldn't reasonably be expected to have two papers on the same thing in the same conference. Um, I suggest you go to NIPS now and see whether. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yoshio Bengio submitted a paper to ICML in about 2009. I'm not certain of the year, but it's around then. Um, and one of the reviewers said that neural network papers had no place in a machine learning conference. So I suggest you go to ICML. Um, CVPR, which is the leading computer vision conference, that was the most outrageous of all, I think. Um, Jan and his co-workers submitted a paper doing semantic segmentation that beat the state of the art. It, it beat what the mainline computer vision people could do. And um, it got rejected. And one of the reviewers said, um, this paper tells us nothing about computer vision because everything's learned. So the reviewer, like the field of computer vision at the time, was stuck in the frame of mind that 
The way you do computer vision is you think about the nature of the task of vision, you preferably write down some equations, you think about how to do the computations that are required to do vision, then you get some implementation of it, and then you see whether it works. Um, the idea that you just learn everything was outside the realm of things that were worth considering. And so the reviewer basically missed the point, which was that everything was learned. Um, he completely failed to see how that completely changed computer vision. Now, I shouldn't be too hard on those guys, because a little later on, they were very reasonable. With a bit more evidence, they suddenly flipped. So between 2005 and 2009, researchers, some of them in Canada, we make Yann an honorary Canadian because he's French, um, <laughs> made several technical advances that allowed backpropagation to work better in feedforward nets. Um, they involved using unsupervised pre-training to initialize the weights before you turn on backpropagation. Things like dropping out units at random to make the whole thing much more robust and introducing rectified linear units, which turned out to be easier to train. Um, for us, the details of those advances are our bread and butter. We're very interested in those. But the main message is that with a few technical advances, backpropagation works amazingly well. And the main reason is because we now have lots of labeled data and a lot of convenient compute power. Inconvenient compute power isn't much use. Um, but things like GPUs, and more recently TPUs, um, allow you to apply a lot of computation, and they made the huge difference. So really, the deciding factor, I think, was the increase in compute power. So I think a lot of the credit for deep learning really goes to the people who collected the big databases, like Fei Fei Li, and the people who made the computers go fast, like um, David Patterson and others, lots of others. So the killer app, from my point of view, was in 2009, when in my lab we got a bunch of GPUs and two graduate students, um, made them do, learn to do um, acoustic modeling. Acoustic modeling means you take something like a spectrogram and you try and figure out for the middle frame of the spectrogram which piece of which phoneme the speaker is trying to express. And in this little database we used, relatively little, um, there are 183 labels for what, which piece of which pho phoneme it might be. And so you pre-train a net with many layers of 2,000 hidden units. Um, you can't pre-train the last layer because you don't know the labels yet. And you're training it just to be able to reproduce what's in the layer below. And then you turn on learning in all the layers, and it does slightly better than the state of the art, which had taken 30 years to develop. When people in speech saw that, the smart people, they realized that with more development, this stuff was going to be amazing. And my graduate students went off to various groups like MSR and IBM and Google. In particular, Navdeep Jaitley went to Google and ported the system for acoustic modeling that was developed in Toronto, fairly literally, and it came out in the Android in 2012. There was a lot of good engineering to make it run in real time. And it gave a big decrease in error rates. And at more or less the same time, all the other groups started changing the way they did speech recognition. And now, all the good speech recognizers use neural nets. They're not like the neural nets we introduced initially. Neural nets have gradually eroded more and more parts of the system. Sort of putting a neural net in your system is a bit like getting gangrene. It'll gradually eat the whole system. Then in 2012, um, two other of my graduate students applied neural nets of the kind developed over many years by Yann Lacan to object recognition on a big database that Fei Fei Li had put together with a thousand different classes of object. And it was finally a big enough database of real images so you could show what neural nets could do, and they could do a lot. So if you looked at the results, um, all the computer vision systems, the standard ones, had asymptoted at about 25% error. Um, our system, developed by two graduate students, um, got 16% error. And then further work on neural nets like that, by 2015, it was down to 5%, and now it's down to considerably below that. So then what happened was exactly what ought to happen in science. 
um, leaders of the computer vision community looked at this result and they said, oh, they really do work. We were wrong. OK, we're going to switch. And within a year, they all switched. And so science finally worked like it was meant to. The last thing I want to talk about is a radically new way to do machine translation, which was introduced in 2014 by people at Google and also in Montreal by people in Yoshiro Benjo's lab. And the idea in 2014 was for each language, we're going to have a neural network. It'll be a recurrent network that is going to encode the string of words in that language, which it receives one at a time, into a big vector. I call that big vector a thought vector. The idea is that big vector captures the meaning of that string of words. Then you take that big vector and you give it to a decoder network, and the decoder network turns the big vector into a string of words in another language. And it sort of worked. And with a bit of development, it worked very well. Since 2014, one of the major pieces of development has been that when you're decoding the meaning of a sentence, what you do is you look back at the sentence you were encoding, and that's called soft attention. So each time you produce a new word, you're deciding where to look in the sentence that you're translating. Um, that helps a lot. You also now pre-train the word embeddings, and that helps a lot. And the way the pre-training works is you take a bunch of words, and you try and reproduce these words in a deep net, but you've left out some of the words. So from these words, you have to reproduce the same words, but you have to fill in the blanks, essentially. Um, they use things called transformers, where in this deep net, as, your, as each word goes through the net, um, it's looking at kind of nearby words to disambiguate what it might mean. So if you have a word like may, when it goes in, you'll get an initial vector that's sort of ambiguous between the modal and the month. But if it sees the 13th next to it, it knows pretty well it's the month. And so in the next layer, it can disambiguate that, and the meaning of that may will be the month. Um, and those transformer nets now work really well for getting word embeddings. They also, it turns out, learn a whole lot of grammar. So all the stuff that linguists thought had to be put in innately, these neural nets are now getting in there. They're getting lots of syntactic understanding but it's all being learned from data. If you look in the early layers of transformer nets, they know what parts of speech things are. Um, if you look in later parts of the nets, they know how to disambiguate pronoun references. Um, basically, they're learning grammar the way a little kid learns grammar, just, by, just from looking at sentences. Um, so I think that the machine translation was really the final nail in the coffin of symbolic AI. Because machine translation is the ideal task for symbolic AI. It's symbols in and it's symbols out. But it turns out if you want to do it well, inside what you need is big vectors. OK, I have um, said everything I wanted to say about the history up to 2014 or so of neural nets. Um, I've emphasized the ideology that there were these two camps and that the good guys won. Um, it's not over yet because, of course, what we need is for neural nets now to begin to be able to explain reasoning. We can't do that yet. We're working on it. But reasoning is the last thing that people do, not the first thing. And reasoning is built on top of all this other stuff. And my view has always been you're never going to understand reasoning until you understand all this other stuff. And now we are beginning to understand all this other stuff, and we're more or less ready to begin to understand reasoning. But reasoning just with sort of bare symbols by using rules that are expressed as other symbols, that seemed to me just hopeless. You're missing all the content. There's no meaning there. OK. I want to talk a little bit about the future of computer vision. So convolutional neural nets have been very effective. And what convolutional neural nets do is they wire in the idea that if a feature is useful in one place, it's also going to be useful in another place. And that allows us to, to combine evidence from different locations to learn a shared feature detector. That is, to learn replicated feature detectors that are the same in all these places. And that's a huge win. It makes it much more data efficient. And those things Yang got working in the 1990s. They were 
one of the few things that worked really well in the 1990s, and they work even better now. But I don't think they're the way people do vision. I mean, I think one aspect of it, that there's replicated apparatus, that's clearly true of the brain, um, but they don't recognize objects the same way as we do. And that leads to adversarial examples. So if I give you a big database, a convolutional neural net will do very well. It may do better than a person. But it doesn't recognize things the same way as a person does. And so I can change things in a way that will cause the convolutional neural net to change its mind, and a person can't even see the changes I've made. They're using things much more like texture and color. They're not using the geometrical relationships between objects and their parts. Um, I'm convinced that people, the main way in which people recognize objects, they obviously use texture and color, but they're very well aware of the geometrical relationships between an object and its parts. And that geometrical relationship is completely independent of viewpoint. And that gives you something that's very robust that you should be able to train from much less data. And I actually can't resist doing a little demonstration to convince you that when you understand objects, it's not just when you're being a scientist that you use coordinate frames. It's even when you're just naively thinking about objects, you impose coordinate frames on them. And so I'm going to do a little demonstration. Um, and you have to participate in this demonstration, otherwise it's no fun. OK, so I want you to imagine sitting on the tabletop in front of you, there's a cube. So here's the top, here's the bottom, here's the cube. It's a wireframe cube like this, OK? Matte black wires. And what I'm going to do with this cube is, a, from your point of view, there's a front, bottom, right-hand corner here, and there's top, back, left-hand corner here. OK. And I'm going to rotate the cube so that the top back left-hand corner is vertically above the front bottom right-hand corner. So here we are. And so now I want you to hold your fingertip in space, probably your left fingertip, where the top vertex of the cube is, OK? And now, nobody's doing it. Come on. <laughs> now, with your other fingertip, I just want you to point to where the other corners of the cube are, the ones that aren't resting on the table. So there's one on the table, one vertically above it here, where are the other corners? And you have to do it. You have to point them out. OK? Now, I can't see what you're doing, but I know that a large number of you will have pointed out four other corners, because I've done this before. And now I want you to imagine a cube in the normal orientation and ask how many corners does it have? OK? It's got eight corners, right? So there's six of these guys. And what most people do is they say, here, 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 and here. What's the problem? Well, the problem is that's not a cube. What you've done is you've preserved the fourfold rotational symmetry that a cube has um, and pointed out a completely different shape. It's a completely different shape that has the same number of faces as a cube has corners and the same number of corners as a cube has faces. It's the dual of a cube if you substitute corners for faces because you really like symmetries so much that you're prepared to really mangle things to preserve the symmetries. Um, actually, a cube has three edges coming down like that and three edges coming up like that, and my six fingertips are where the corners are, okay? And people just can't see that, unless they're crystallographers or very clever. Um, so the main point of this demo is I forced you, by doing this rotation, to use an axis for the cube. The main axis that defined the orientation of the cube was not one of the axes of the coordinate frame you usually use for a cube. And by forcing you to use an unfamiliar coordinate frame, I destroyed all your knowledge about where the parts of a cube are. You understand things relative to coordinate frames. And if I get you to impose a different coordinate frame, it's just a different object as far as you're concerned. Now, convolutional nets don't do that. And because they don't do that, I don't think they're the way people perceive shapes. Um, we've recently managed to make neural nets do that by doing some self-supervised training. And there's an archive reference there which if you're very quick, um, you could get, or you could, um, I'll send out a tweet about it later. And the last thing I want to say is about, not about shape recognition in particular, but about the future of neural networks. There's something very funny and very unbiological we've been doing for the last 50 years, which is we've only been using two timescales. That is, you have neural activities, and they change rapidly. And you have weights, and they change slowly. And that's it. 
But we know that in biology, synapses change at all sorts of timescales. And the question is, what happens if you now introduce more timescales? In particular, let's just introduce one more timescale, and let's say that in addition to these weights changing slowly, and that's what's going on in long-term learning, the weights, the weights have a component, the very same weights, the very same synapses, but there's an extra component that can change more rapidly and decays quite rapidly. So if you ask, where's your memory of the fact that a minute ago I put my finger on this corner here, is that in a bunch of neurons that are sitting there, um, sort of being active so that you can remember that? That seems unlikely. It's much more likely your memory for this is in fast modifications to the weights of the neural network that allow you to reconstruct this very rapidly and that will decay with time. Um, so you've got a memory that's in the weights that's a short-term memory. As soon as you do that, all sorts of good things happen. Um, you can use that to get a better optimization method, and you can use that to do something that may very well be relevant to reasoning, you can use it to allow neural networks to do true recursion. Not very deep, but true recursion. And what I mean by true recursion is, when you do the recursive call, like a relative clause in a sentence, the neural net can use all the same neurons and all the same weights that it was using for the whole sentence to process the relative clause. And of course, to do that, somehow it has to remember what was going on when it decided to process the relative clause. It has to store that somewhere. And I don't think it stores it in other neurons. I think it stores it in temporary changes to synapse strengths. And when it's finished processing the relative clause, it packages it up and says, basically it says, now what was I doing when I started doing this processing? And it can get the information back from this associative memory in the fast weights. Um, I wanted to finish with that because the very first talk I gave in 1973 was about exactly that. I had a system that worked on a computer that had 64K of memory. Um, I haven't got around to publishing it yet, but I think it's becoming fashionable again, so I soon will. And that's the end of my talk, and I'm out of time. <laughs> and now I'd like to introduce Janneke who's not only a colleague, but a very good friend. Okay. I'll talk about the sequel. But I'll start also with a little bit of history and sort of go through some of the things that uh, Jeff just mentioned. So Jeff talked about uh, about supervised running, and supervised running works amazingly well if you have lots of data. Uh, we all know this, so we can do speech recognition, we can do uh, image recognition, we can do face recognition, we can, do, we can generate captions for images, we can do translation, that works really well. Um, and if you give your neural net a particular structure, something like a convolutional net, uh, as Jeff mentioned in the late 80s, early 90s, we could uh, train systems to recognize handwriting that was quite successful. Uh, by the end of the 90s, a system of this type that I built at Bell Labs uh, was reading something like 10 to 20% of all the checks in the US. So uh, a big success, even a commercial success. But, that, but by that time, the entire community had basically abandoned neural nets, partly because of the lack of large data sets for which they could work, partly because the type of software at the time that you had to write was fairly complicated. and. It, uh, it was a big investment to, um, to, to do this, partly also because computers were not fast enough for uh, all kinds of other applications. But convolutional nets really are inspired by uh, biology. They're not copied in biology, but there is a lot of inspiration from, from biology, from the architecture of the visual cortex, and ideas that come naturally when you study signal processing, the idea that filtering is, is a good way to kind of process uh, signals, whether they are audio signals or image, image signals, and that convolutions is a way to do filtering is very natural, and the fact that you find this in the brain is really not that surprising. Um, and those ideas, of course, were uh, proposed by Hubo and Weasel in sort of classic work in neuroscience back in the 60s, as well as, uh, and, and sort of picked up by uh, Fukushima, who is uh, a Japanese re researcher who tried to uh, build computer models of uh, the, the Hubo and Weasel model, if you want. And I found that inspiring 
and, and sort of try to reproduce this using uh, neural nets that could be trained with backpropagation. That's basically what a convolutional net uh, is. And so the idea of a convolutional net is that uh, the, the world, the perceptual world is uh, compositional, that the, the visual world, objects are formed by parts and parts are formed by motifs and motifs are formed by uh, textures or elementary combinations of edges and edges are formed by, by pixels, arrangements of pixels. And so if you have a system that sort of hierarchically can detect uh, uh, unusually useful combinations of pixels into edges and edges into motifs and motifs into parts of objects, then you will have a recognition system. This idea of hierarchy actually goes back a long time. And so that's, uh, that's really the principle of, of convolutional nets. And it turns out that um, hierarchical representations are good not just for, for vision, but also for speech, for text, and for all kinds of other natural signals that are comprehensible because they are compositional. Um, I think there is this saying, uh, it's attributed to Einstein, I believe, the, uh, what is most uh, mysterious about the world is that it is understandable. And it's probably because of the compositional nature of, uh, of, the natural, of natural signals. So uh, in the early 90s, we were able to do things like build recognition systems like this one. This is a younger version of myself here. Uh, I'm at Bell Labs. This is, by the way, my phone number at Bell Labs in Hondel, no longer operating. I'm hitting a key here, and the system captures an image with a video camera. This runs on the PC with a special DSP card in it, and it could run those conventional nets at you know, several hundred characters per second at the time, which was amazing. We could run 20 megaflops. You know, that was just incredible. So that worked pretty well. And uh, pretty soon we realized we could use this for natural images as well to do things like detecting uh, uh, faces, eventually detecting pedestrians. That took um, a few years. Uh, but as uh, Jeff mentioned, there was sort of a neural net winter between the mid-90s and the uh, sort of late 2000s, if you want, where uh, almost nobody was working on neural nets except a few crazy people like us. Um, so that didn't stop us. And so uh, working on face detection, pedestrian detection, even working on uh, using machine learning and, and convolutional net for uh, robotics, where we, we would use a convolutional net to label an entire image in such a way that uh, every pixel in an image would be labeled as to whether it's traversable or not traversable by a robot. And the nice thing about this is that you can, uh, you can collect data automatically. You don't need to manually label it because uh, using stereo vision, you can figure out if uh, a pixel sticks out of the ground or not uh, using 3D reconstruction. But unfortunately, that only works at short range. So if you want a system that can plan long range trajectories, then you can train a convolutional net to make the predictions for traversability using those labels and then uh, let the, the robot drive itself around. So it's got this particular robot here as a combination of different uh, uh, features that it uses um, uh, extracted by the convolutional net and uh, also a, a, a rapid stereo vision system that allows it to avoid obstacles such as basically graduate students. Uh, Pierre Sermanet and Raya Hetzel, by the way, who are pretty s sure the robot is not going to run them over because they actually wrote the code. Um, okay, and then uh, a couple of years later, we uh, used a very similar system to do semantic segmentation. This is actually the work that uh, Jeff was talking about that was rejected from CVPR 2011. Uh, so this is the, a system that could, in real time, using a FPGA implementation, uh, segment, you know, basically give uh, a, a category for every pixel in an image um, at, at about 30 frames per second at sort of decent resolution. It was far from perfect, but it could sort of label with sort of reasonable accuracy, detect pedestrians, detect the roads and the trees and et cetera. Um, but the results basically were not immediately believed by the uh, computer vision community. Now, to measure the progress that has happened uh, since then, in the last 10 years, essentially. Uh, this is an example of a result of a very recent system that was put together by a team at Facebook um, that they call the Panoptic Feature Pyramid Network. So it's basically a large convolutional net that has uh, sort of a, a path that extracts features, um, multi-layer path that extracts features, and then another path that sort of generates an output image. And the output image basically identifies and 
generates a, a mask for every instance of every object in the image and tells you what category they are. So here the name of the categories are not displayed, but it can recognize something like a few hundred categories, people, vehicles of various kinds, uh, and not just object categories, but also sort of background uh, uh, sort of textures or regions, things like you know, grass and sand and uh, trees and things like that. So you would imagine a system like this would be very useful for things like self-driving cars if you had a complete segmentation identification of all the pixels in an image, uh, it would make it easier to build self-driving cars. Not just, not just self-driving cars, but also medical image analysis systems. So this is a relatively similar architecture. People call this U-net sometimes because of the obvious U-shaped of this, uh, of this uh, conventional net. Again, it has uh, an encoder part that sort of extracts features and then a, a sort of a part that constructs the output image where the, the parts of the uh, medical images are, are segmented. This is the kind of result that it's producing. Uh, this is some work by uh, some of my colleagues at NYU. I was not involved in this work. Uh, this, uh, a different subgroup of colleagues with some common co-authors has worked also on uh, detecting breast cancer from, from imaging, from, from uh, x-rays, uh, from mammograms. Uh, in fact, one of the most sort of hottest topics in uh, in, in uh, radiology this, these days is using deep learning for uh, medical image analysis. It's, a, it's probably going to affect, if not revolutionize, uh, radiology in the next few years. It's already, it already has to some extent. Uh, some more work along those directions. Uh, this is uh, actually a collaboration between the NYU Medical School and Facebook Air Research in accelerating the data collection for MRI. So when you uh, go to an MRI, you have to sit in the machine for about an hour or 20 minutes, depending on the kind of exam you're going through. And uh, this uh, technique here, using this kind of uh, reconstruction uh, conventional net, allows to basically reduce the data collection time and get images that are essentially of the same quality. Um, so that will not put radiology out of jobs, um, but it will make the job more interesting, probably. Um, Jeff was mentioning uh, work on uh, translation with, with neural nets. This is, uh, I think, a, a very surprising and interesting development of the fact that you can use neural nets to do translation. Um, and th there is a, a lot of innovation in the kind of architectures that are used for this. So uh, Jeff talked about the attention mechanism, the transformer architecture. This is uh, a new one called dynamic convolutions, which kind of recycles a bit of those ideas. And, and things work re uh, really well there. Those networks are very large. They have a few hundred million parameters in them. And so the, the, some of the challenges there is actually running them uh, on, on GPUs, having enough memory to run them. We were basically limited by uh, GPU memory there. So those ideas of image segmentation have been used by uh, people working on self-driving cars, particularly uh, people at Mobileye, going, uh, which is now uh, Intel, going back several years. Uh, those. The first convolutional nets, I think, that were deployed for self-driving cars or for driving assistance were in the uh, 2015 uh, Tesla S model. NVIDIA has uh, devoted a large uh, set of efforts also to self-driving cars. And so there's a lot of interesting things going on there. But progress is, uh, I wouldn't say slow, but auto completely autonomous driving is a hard problem. It's not as easy as people thought initially. OK. so. Um, Jeff uh, kind of brushed away reinforcement learning, but reinforcement learning is something that a lot of people are really excited about, particularly people at DeepMind. Um, but there is a problem with the current crop of reinforcement learning, which is that it's extremely data inefficient. If you want to train a system to do anything using reinforcement learning, it will have to do lots and lots of trial and errors. So for example, to get a machine to play Atari games, classic Atari games, to the level that any human can reach in about 15 minutes of training, uh, the machine will have to play the equivalent of 80 hours of, of real-time play. Um, to pl uh, play uh, Go at a uh, superhuman level, it will have to, to play something like 20 million games. To play StarCraft, this is a recent DeepMind uh, work. Um, it's a blog post, not a paper. Uh, the Alpha Star system uh, took the equivalent of 200 years of uh, real-time play to reach uh, human level on a single map for kind of a single type of player. Um, by the way, all those systems use ConvNets and various other things, but uh, that's an interesting thing. So the problem with reinforcement learning is that those, those models have to try something 
to, to know if it's gonna work. And it's really not practical to use in the real world if you wanna train a robot to grasp uh, things or you wanna train a car to drive itself. So, you know, to figure out, um, to train a system to drive a car so it doesn't run off cliffs, it will actually have to drive to, you know, it will actually have to run off a cliff multiple times before it figures out how not to do that. First of all, to figure out it's a bad idea, and second, to figure out how not to do it. Because it doesn't have a model of the world. It doesn't, it can't imagine what's gonna happen before it happens. It has to try things to correct itself. That's why it's so inefficient. So that begs the question, how is it that humans and animals can learn so efficiently, so quickly? We can learn to drive a car. Most of us can learn to drive a car in about 20 hours of training with hardly any accident. How does that happen? We don't run off cliffs because we have a pretty good intuitive physics model that tells us if, I turn, if I'm driving next to a cliff and I'm turning the wheel to the right, the car is gonna run off the cliff, it's gonna fall, and nothing good is gonna come out of this, okay? So we have this internal model, and the question is, how do we learn this internal model? And, then, and the next question is, how do we get machines to learn internal models like that? Basically just by observation. So there is a, um, a gentleman called Emmanuel Dupou in Paris. He's a developmental uh, psychologist. Um, he works actually on how children learn language and speech and things like that, but also other concepts. And he made this chart about the time uh, the, the age in months at which babies learn basic concepts, like things like uh, distinguishing animate objects from inanimate objects. That happens really quickly around three months old. Uh, the fact that uh, some objects are, are stable, some of them will fall, uh, and you can sort of measure whether babies are surprised by the behavior of some objects. And then it takes about nine months for babies to figure out that objects th that are not supported will fall, basically gravity. So if you show a six-month six old baby the, the, the scenario on the top left where there's a little car on a platform and you push the little car off the platform and the car doesn't fall, it's a trick. Babies six months old don't even pay attention. That's just another thing that the world throws at them that they, you know, they have to learn. It's fine. A nine-month-old baby will go like the little girl at the bottom left be very, very surprised. In the meantime, they've learned the concept of gravity. And nobody has really told them what gravity is. They've just kind of observed the world and they figured out objects that are not supported just fall. And so when that doesn't happen, they get surprised. How does that happen? It's not just humans. Animals have those models too. You know, cats, dogs, rats, orangutans. So here is a baby orangutan here. He's being shown a magic trick. Put an object in a cup. Um, remove the object, but he doesn't see that. Then show the cup, it's empty. He was on the floor laughing. <laughs> so his model of the world was violated, right? He has a pretty good model of the world. Object permanence, that's a very basic concept. Objects are not supposed to disappear like that. Um, and when your model of the world is being violated, you pay attention because you're gonna learn something about the world you didn't know. Uh, if it really violates a very basic thing about the world, it's funny, uh, but it's also it might be dangerous, right? It might, it's something that can kill you because you, you just didn't predict what's, uh, what, what just happened. Okay, so what's the salvation? Really, you know, how do we get machines to learn this, this kind of stuff? You know, learn all the huge amount of background knowledge we learn about the world by just uh, observing in the first few months of life. Uh, and animals do this too. So for example, if I ask you, um, if I train myself to predict what the world is gonna look like when I move my head slightly to the left, because of parallax motion, objects that are nearby and objects that are far away won't move uh, the same way relative to you know, my, my, uh, my viewpoint. And so the best way to predict how the world is gonna look when I move my head is to basically represent internally the notion of depth and conse consequently, sort of conversely, if I train a system to predict what the, world, what the world is gonna look like when it moves its camera, maybe it's gonna learn the notion of depth automatically. And once you have depth, you have objects because you have objects in front of others, you have occlusion edges. Once you have objects, you have you know, things you can influence and things that can move independently of others and things like that. So concepts can kind of build on top of each other, 
each other like this through uh, prediction. So that's the idea of self-supervised learning. It's prediction and reconstruction. I give the machine a piece of data, let's say a video clip. I mask a piece of that video clip, and I ask the system to predict the missing part from the part that it, it can observe. Okay, so that would be video prediction, just predict the future. Um, but the more general form of self-supervised learning is I don't specify in advance which part I'm gonna mask or not. Uh, I'm just gonna tell the system I'm gonna mask a piece of it and whatever is masked, you, I'm asking you to re reconstruct it. And in fact, I may not even mask it at all. I'm just gonna virtually mask it and just ask the system to reconstruct the input under certain constraints. So the advantage of this self-supervised learning is that it's not task dependent. You get the machine to learn about the world without training it for a particular task. And so you can learn just by observation without having to interact with the world, which is much more efficient. But more importantly, you're asking the system to predict a lot of stuff. Not just a, a value function like in reinforcement learning where basically the only thing you give the machine to predict is a, a scalar value once in a while. Not reinforcement, not uh, supervised learning where you ask the system to predict uh, a label, which is a few bits. In the case of self-supervised learning, you're asking the machine to predict a lot of stuff. And so that led me to this slightly obnoxious analogy, at least for people who work on reinforcement learning, um, which is the idea that if intelligence or learning is a, is a cake, the bulk of the cake, the génoise, as we say in French, uh, is really self-supervised learning. Most of what we learn, most of the knowledge we accumulate about the world is learned through self-supervised learning. Um, there's a little bit of icing on the cake, which is supervised learning. We're you know, being shown a picture book and we're being told the name of objects and with just a few examples we can uh, know what the objects are. Um, we're, we're taught the meaning of some words and you know, babies can learn, uh, young, inf young children can learn many, many words per day new words. And then the cherry on the cake is reinforcement learning. It's, it's a very small amount of information you're asking the machine to predict, and so there is no way that the machine can learn purely from, from that form of learning. It has to be a combination of uh, probably all three forms of learning, but, but principally um, self-supervised learning. This idea is not new. A lot of people have argued for the idea of prediction for, uh, for learning, the idea of uh, learning models, um, predictive models. And uh, uh, one, one such person is, is Jeff, as a matter of fact. This is a quote from, from him, uh, which, you know, this is from a few years ago, but he's been saying this for about 40 years, at least for longer than I've known him. Um, and, and it goes like this. The brain has about 10 to the 14 synapses, and we only live about uh, 10 to the 9 seconds, so we have a lot more parameters than data. This motivates the idea that we must do a lot of unsupervised learning or self-supervised learning, since the perceptual input, including proprioception, is the only place where we can get 10 to the 50 dimensions of constraints per second. If you're asked to predict everything that comes into your, sense, your, 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 your senses, uh, you know, every fraction of a second, that's a lot of information you have to learn, and that might be enough to constrain all the synapses we have in our brain to learn things that are meaningful. So the sequel of deep learning uh, in my opinion, is self-supervised learning. And in fact, historically, as Jeff mentioned, the, the, the sort of deep learning conspiracy that, that Yoshua, Jeff and I started in the early 2000s was focused on unsupervised learning, unsupervised pre-training. And it was partly successful, but we kind of put it uh, on the back burner for a while, and it's coming back to the fore now. It's gonna create a new revolution, at least that's my prediction and the next, the revolution will not be supervised. So I have to thank uh, Alyosha Efros for this slogan. He invented it. Uh, of, of course, he got inspired by Jill Scott Heron. You know, the, the revolution will not be televised. You can even get a t-shirt with it now. Um, so what is self-supervised learning really? Self-supervised learning is filling in the blanks. Uh, and it works really well for natural language processing. So natural language processing, uh, a method that has become standard over the last year uh, in models like BERT and, and others is you take a, a long uh, sequence of words extracted from a corpus of, of text, you blank out uh, some proportion of the words, and you train a very large neural net based on those transformer architectures or various other architectures to predict the missing words. And in fact, it cannot exactly predict the missing words, so you're asking it to predict the distribution over the entire vocabulary 
for the probability that every, you know, each word may, may occur at, at, at those locations. Um, so that's called, that's a special case of what we call a masked autoencoder. Okay, given an input, ask, ask it to reconstruct. So there's part of input that, are not, that is not present. People have been trying to do this in the context of image recognition as well. There's, there's various attempts at doing this. So uh, this is work from uh, Patak et al. Uh, from a few years ago where you blank out some pieces of an image and then you ask the system to fill, it, to fill them in. And it's only partially successful, not nearly as successful as in the context of natural language processing. So natural language processing, there's been a revolution over the last year of using those pre-training systems for natural language understanding, translation, all kinds of stuff, and the performance is amazing. It, they're very, very big models, but the performance really works really well. And there were sort of early indications of this uh, in work that uh, uh, Yosha Benjo did uh, a long time ago in the 90s, and uh, Pardon Colbert and Jason Weston did in the, uh, around 2010 uh, in uh, using neural nets for NLP. And then more recent work, word 2 vec FastX, et cetera, which used this idea of predicting words from their context, basically. So it really is sort of the, this, this whole idea is completely taken off. So why does it work for natural, natural language processing, and why does it not work so well for, for in the context of images and vision? I think it's because of the sort of how we represent uncertainty or how we do not represent uncertainty. So let's say we want to do video prediction. We, um, we have short video clips with a few frames. In this case here, a little girl approaching a birthday cake. And then we ask the machine to predict the next few frames in the video. Uh, if you train a, a large neural net to predict the next few frames using least squared error, you know, squared error, um, what you get are blurry predictions. Why? Because the system cannot exactly predict what's gonna happen, and so it, the best thing you can do is predict the average of all the possible futures. To be more concrete, let's say all the videos consist of someone putting a pen on the table and letting it go, and every time you repeat the experiment, the pen falls in a different direction, and you can't really predict in which direction it's gonna fall. Then if you predict the average of all the outcomes, it would be a transparent pen, uh, you know, superimposed on itself in all possible orientations. That's not a good prediction. So if you want a system to be able to represent multiple predictions, it has to have what's called a latent variable. So you have a function implemented by a neural net. It takes the past, let's say a few frames from a video, and it wants to predict the next few frames. It has to have an extra variable here, it's called z, so that when you vary this variable, the output varies over a particular set of plausible predictions. Okay, that's called a latent variable model. The problem with training those things is that there is basically only two ways of training them that we know about, or two kind of uh, families of, of, uh, of ways to train those systems. One is a very cool idea from uh, Ian Goodfellow and his collaborators at the University of Montreal a few years ago called adversarial training or generative adversarial networks. And the idea of uh, 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 GANs, generative adversarial networks, is to train a second neural net to tell the first neural net whether its prediction is on this manifold or, or set of plausible futures or not. And you train those two networks simultaneously. Um, there's another technique that consists in sort of inferring what the ideal value of the latent variable would be to make a good prediction. But if you do this, you have the danger that the latent variable will capture all the information there is to, to capture about, about the prediction, and no information will actually be used from the past to make that prediction. So you have to regularize this latent variable. Okay, so um, those uh, ideas of things like uh, adversarial training work really well. So what you see here at the bottom is a video prediction for a small, a short clip where the system has been trained with this adversarial training. Uh, and there are you know, various ways of doing those uh, predictions, not just in pixel space, but also in the space of objects uh, that have been already segmented. Um, those adversarial, uh, generative adversarial networks uh, can generate uh, images that are used for kind of uh, assistance to sort of artistic production. So these are non-existing faces. You have a system here that's been trained to produce an image that looks like a celebrity. And after the system is trained, you feed it uh, a few hundred random numbers and that comes a face that doesn't exist. And they look pretty good. This is work by NVIDIA from uh, this year, actually. It was presented this year. Um, you can use this to produce all kinds of different things like, you know, um, clothing, for example, training on a collection of uh, uh, 
clothes from a famous designer. Um, so I think we need sort of new ways of uh, represent of, of sort of formulating this problem of unsupervised learning so that our systems can deal with this uh, uncertainty in the prediction in the context of continuous high dimensional spaces. We don't have the problem in the context of um, uh, adversarial of um, natural language processing because it's easy to represent a distribution over words. It's just a discrete distribution. It's a long vector of numbers between zero and one that sum to one but it's very hard in continuous high dimensional spaces. And so we need new techniques for this. And one technique I'm proposing is something called energy-based uh, self-supervised learning, which is imagine that uh, your world is two dimensional. You only have two input variables, two sensors, and your entire uh, world, your entire training set is composed of those dots here in this two dimensional space. Uh, what you'd like is to train a contrast function, let's call it an energy, that gives low energy to points that are on the manifold of data and higher energy outside. And there is basically a lot of research to do there to find the best method to do this. Uh, my favorite one is what I call regularized latent variable models. And we had some success about 10 years ago in using techniques of this type for learning features in a convolutional net completely unsupervised. Uh, what you see on the left here is uh, animation of a system that learns uh, basically oriented filters by just being trained with natural image patches to reconstruct those under sparsity constraints. Uh, and what you see on the right is uh, filters of a convolutional net that are learned um, in the same, uh, uh, with the same algorithm with different numbers of filters. Those things kind of work. They don't beat supervised learning if you have tons of data, but the hope is that they will reduce the amount of necessary labeled data. So I'm gonna end with um, an example of how to combine, combine all this to get a machine to learn something um, uh, useful like a, like a task, a motor task. Uh, so here what I'm, what I'm talking about is, can we train a machine to learn to drive by just observing uh, other people driving and by training a model of uh, what goes on in the world? So you are in your car, you can see all the cars around you, and if you can predict what the cars around you are gonna do ahead of time, then you can drive defensively, basically. You can, you can decide to stay away from this car because you see it swerving. You can decide to uh, you know, kind of slow down because the car in front of you is likely to, uh, to slow down because there's another car in front of it that is, is slowing down. So you have all those predictive models that basically keep you safe and you've sort of learned to integrate them over time. You don't even have to think about it. You, it's just in your, in your sort of reflexes of, of driving. You can talk at the same time and, and you, you'll, you'll work. Um, but the way to train a system like this is you first have to train a forward model. So a forward model would be, uh, here is the state of the world at time t. Give me the, a prediction about the state of the world at time t plus one. And the problem with this, of course, is the world is not deterministic. There's a lot of things that could happen. So it's the same problem I was talking about with a pen. Many things can happen. So, but if you had such a forward model, you could run the forward model multiple time steps and then if you had a, an objective function, like how far you are from the other cars, whether you are in lane, things like this, you could backpropagate gradient through this entire system to train a neural net to predict the correct course of action that would, uh, that would be safe over the long run. And this can be done completely in your head. If you have a forward model in your head, you don't have to actually drive to train yourself to drive. You can just imagine all of those things. So that's a specific example. So you put a camera looking down at a highway. It follows every car and it extracts a little rectangle around every car that follows every car that you see at the bottom. And, uh, and what you're doing now is you're training a convolutional net to take a few frames centered on a particular car and predict the next state of the world. And if you do this, um, you get, uh, oops, sorry. you get the second column. So the, the, the column on the left is what happens in the real world. The second column is what happens if you just train a convolutional net with least square to predict what's gonna happen. It can only predict the average of all the possible futures and so you get blurry predictions. If you now transform the model so it has a latent variable that allows it to take into account the uncertainty about the world, and I'm not going to explain exactly how that works, then you get the, the prediction that you just saw um, 
on the, on the right, where for every drawing of this latent variable, you get different predictions, but they are crisp. Okay, so now what you can do is, um, you can, to do this training I was telling you about earlier, you sample this latent variable, so you get different pos possible scenarios about what's gonna happen in your future, then through backpropagation, you train your policy network uh, to get your system to drive, and if you do this, it doesn't work. It doesn't work because the system goes into regions of the state space where you f the forward model is very inaccurate and very uncertain. So what you have to do is add another term in the objective function that prevents the system from going into parts of the space where it doesn't, where its predictions are bad. Okay, so it's like an inverse curiosity uh, constraint if you want. And if you do this, it works. So these are examples of uh, the blue car is driving itself, the little white dot indicates whether it accelerates, whether it brakes, or whether it turns, and it kind of keeps itself safe away from the other cars. The other cars can't see it. The blue car is invisible here. Uh, let me show you another example here. Um, so here the yellow car is the actual car in the video. The blue car is what the agent here that's been trained is, uh, is doing. And it's being squeezed between two cars, so it has to escape because the other cars don't see it. So it has to squeeze out. Um, but it works. It works reasonably well. And basically that system has never interacted with the real world. It's just watched other people drive and then it's used that for, for training its uh, action plans, basically its policy. Okay, now I'm gonna go a little uh, uh, philo philosophical, if you want. Um, there is, tr throughout history of technology and science, there's been this phenomenon, it's not universal, but it's pretty frequent, where people invent an artifact and then derive a science out of this artifact to explain how this artifact works or to kind of, uh, uh, figure out its limitations. So a good example is the invention of the telescope uh, in the 1600s. Optics was not developed until at least 50 years later. Uh, but people had a good intuition of how to build telescopes before that. A steam engine was invented in the late 1600s, early 1700s. And thermodynamics was, you know, came up more than 100 years later, basically designed to uh, explain the limitations of thermal engines. And thermodynamics now is the foundation of one of the most fundamental intellectual construction of all science. Uh, so it was purposely defined to explain a particular artifact. That's really interesting. Um, same thing with electromagnetism and electrodynamics with uh, you know, the invention of sailboats and airplanes and aerodynamics, uh, uh, you know, invention of compounds and chemistry to explain, et cetera, right? Computers and computer science came after the invention of computers, right? Uh, information theory came after the invention of uh, first digital communication uh, through radio and teletype and things like that. So it's quite possible that now we have, you know, in the next few decades, we'll have empirical systems that are built by uh, trial and error, perhaps by systematic optimization on powerful machines, perhaps by intuitions, by uh, empirical work, perhaps with a little bit of theory, perhaps a lot of theory, hopefully. And the question is whether this will lead to uh, a whole theory of intelligence. The fact that we can build an artifact that is intelligent might lead to a general theory of information processing and intelligence. Um, and that's kind of uh, a big hope. Uh, I'm not sure this is gonna be realized over the next uh, few decades, but uh, that's a good program. A word of caution about biological inspiration. So neural nets are biologically inspired, convolutional nets are biologically inspired, but they're just inspired, they're not copied. Um, let me give you a story of a gentleman called Clément Adéa. Uh, is there any French people in the room here? Okay, can you raise your hand? French people, no French people? Yeah, okay, a couple. You heard of Clément Adéa? Never heard of Clément Adéa? Yeah, you have, okay. Is there anyone who is not French who has heard of Clément Adéa? Okay. One person, two person. Basically nobody. You guys have no idea who he is, right? Okay, so this guy built in the late 1800 a bat-shaped airplane, steam-powered. He was a steam engine designer. And his airplane actually took off on its own power 13 years before the Wright brothers, uh, flew for about 50 meters at about 50 centimeters altitude, and then kind of crashed and landed. Um, it was basically uncontrollable. 
So basically, the guy just copied bats and just assumed that because it has the shape of a bat, it would just fly. Right? Uh, that seemed a little bit naive. It was not naive at all, but it was it, it kind of you know stuck a little bit too close to biology and and got sort of hypnotized by it a little bit, and didn't do things like you know build a model or a glider or a kite or you know, a wind tunnel, like the, like the Wright brothers did. Um, so he, he stuck a little too close to biology. On the other hand, he had a big legacy, which is that his second airplane was called the Avion, and that's actually the word in French, uh, Spanish, and Portuguese uh, for airplane. So he had some legacy. Um, but he was kind of a secretive guy. He, you know, this was before the open source days. And so this is why you never heard of him. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jan. Uh, we have, can we get the house lights on, please? We have two microphones up, and we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, house lights on, please. I know they came on earlier. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, well, first, let's give Jan and Jeff a round of applause for an amazing, amazing talk. A little piece of trivia while someone comes up to the microphone. Uh, Alan Turing's birthday was June 23rd, 1912. So today is the 107th birth anniversary, and so it's very appropriate that we had this memorable Turing lecture today. Okay, question. Oh, yeah. Hi, thank you both. Um, I'm really interested in the work on understanding reasoning. Can you give us a little taste of what you're thinking there? The, the reasoning of how neural nets, you know, reason. Okay, so um, neural nets are pretty good at things you do in parallel in 100 milliseconds. Um, so far, they're not so good at things you do over longer time periods. And in particular, one thing that people criticize neural nets for is they can't do recursion. So when we understand a sentence, we can go off into a relative clause and understand the relative clause, and we devote all our effort to understanding that relative clause, and then come back again. And that kind of thing, um, we're just beginning to be able to do with neural nets. So people at Facebook have done lots of that, people at Google are doing it, but um, in order to do things like that, you need some kind of memory. The typical thing to use in a neural net is you just have another bank of neurons, which are copies of neurons you already have. But that's not biologically plausible. So I always want something that's biologically plausible. Um, and in the brain, it seems much more likely that this memory is not copies of neural activities. It's an associative memory that can recreate neural activities. But it's, it's one that's just used for temporary things. There's actually quite a lot of work on this, on sort of you know, trying to sort of fill the gap of uh, neural nets not being able to do long chains of reasoning. Uh, so there's one question that uh, you know, Jeff has been sort of advocating for, for a long time is the fact that uh, if you have sort of classical logic-based reasoning, it's discrete, therefore incompatible with gradient-based learning. And so how can you do reasoning with vectors by replacing symbols by vectors and replacing logic by continuous functions, basically parameterized continuous functions? Uh, and then if you want long chains of reasoning, you need to have a working memory. So Jeff was kind of mentioning one idea using fast weights. There's a lot of people working on what's called memory networks. So you have basically what amounts to a recurrent net, which can access a separate neural net, which is also differentiable, but it's built the particular architecture that turns it into an associative memory, basically. Um, and those kind of work in simple cases. They haven't really been scaled up to uh, big problems, but there is uh, very interesting work uh, on uh, basically neural nets that do not directly compute an answer, but they produce a neural net which is designed to answer, to answer the question that's being asked. So uh, uh, visual question answering is a typical example of this. You, you show a complex image to a system, and you ask it, uh, you know, is there a Chinese sphere that is larger than uh, the two cubes in this picture, right? And what the neural net does is that it produces a neural ne another neural net which has the right module to answer that question. You can train this whole thing with backprop, and it's kind of amazing that it works at all. Um, but it works. Uh, one more question. Yeah. 
Oh, sorry. Go, yeah, go ahead. Ivan from Northeastern University. So I know many people question about neural network, saying that we know neural network neural network work, but we don't know how they work. So what I wonder what's your comments on this uh, question? It's not really true. I mean, we have some understanding, of course. I mean, first of all, we have access to everything inside the machine, right? Uh, I mean, obviously, those things have hundreds of millions of parameters you know, hundreds of thousands of variables inside, it's gonna be complicated. It has to be complicated because we want them to solve complicated problems. So thinking that you're gonna have a complete understanding of exactly every detail is, is hopeless. Um, on the other hand, I think there is quite a lot of theoretical understanding of, for example, why optimization seems to work in, in, in large networks, why people, why, you know, the system doesn't seem to be trapped in local minima, for example, uh, or, you know, the kind of representations that I learned. I have something to say about that too, which is um, most of the things people do, we don't know how they work. We have no idea how they do it. And so if you replace people by neural networks, you're no worse off than you were with people. In fact, you're, prob you're probably better off because you can correct for bias better with a neural network than you can with a person. But the other thing is there may be some tasks where you need to use hundreds of thousands of weak regularities in the data to make a prediction. And there's no simple rules. There's just lots of weak regularities. And what big neural nets do is they use them all and they say, you know, 300,000 regularities say yes and 150,000 regularities say no, so it's probably yes. And if you ask me, but how did it do it? If you're expecting to get some lines of computer code that would compute that, you're not gonna get it. This neural network has a billion weights in it and the way it did it was those billion weights had these values and that may be the best you can get. So for that kind of decision, you're just going to have to live with the fact that people have intuitions and their intuitions tell them what to do. And neural nets have intuitions too. And they work by having, the same way they do with people, by having large numbers of weights that conspire together to say this is more likely than that. Thanks. Uh, I know you've been waiting, so why don't you go ahead and then we'll take one more from there. Yeah. Sorry, just a quick question. On other um, AI aspects like evolutionary computation and stuff, do you have some opinion? Um, where they, whether they will... Sorry, I didn't hear what you said. On other AI fields, like evolutionary computation, for example, um, do you have any opinion on those? Because you sort of mentioned only symbolic and neural. Did you say evolution? Um, like genetic programming, those kind of things. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's great for setting hyperparameters. That is, if you're in a high-dimensional space and you want to improve, if you can get a gradient, you're going to do much better than someone who can't get a gradient. And the brain is a device for getting gradients, I believe. Evolution can't get gradients because a lot of what determines the relationship between the genotype and the phenotype is outside your control. It's the environment. So evolution has to use techniques like mutation, random changes, and recombinations. Um, but we're not limited to that. We can produce a device that can get gradients. Now, obviously, if you can get gradients, um, you can also use evolution to make that device better. And if you look at what happens in neural nets now, um, you train a neural net using gradients, but now you fiddle with the hyperparameters using something much more like an evolutionary technique. So. I think we have uh, time for one more question from that side. Thank you. Uh, so, um, Yen talked about using CNs or other types of neural nets in perception for autonomous, drive, uh, autonomous vehicles, and doesn't sound uh, very positive. So could you make some more comments on that? Well, there's been, uh, you know, a lot of uh, declaration, probably kind of more marketing-oriented than science-oriented, that uh, fully autonomous driving is just around the corner. And uh, it's just a lot harder than most people imagine. A lot of people in the business, of course, knew it was hard, and it wasn't, it, it's not just around the corner. I think there's a similar story in a lot of areas of, of AI, and, you know, AI as a whole, where um, a lot of people had very optimistic expectations about like when human level AI will be attained, for example. Uh, in my opinion, it's not just around the corner. There are certainly things like, uh, you know, how to do self supervision properly that need to be figured out before that happens. But it's not the only, the only obstacles, it's just the, the first mountain that we see and there might be a whole bunch of mountains behind that we haven't figured out. So I think it's a little bit the same for, uh, uh, for self, self, uh, autonomous driving. Autonomous driving, it's easy to get early impressive results where a car appears to drive itself pretty well for you know, about half an hour. Uh, 
uh, but to get the same level of reliability as humans, which is one fatal accident per 100 miles, per 100 million miles, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> You know, what's 10 to the 6 between friends? Um, <laughs> then, it, you know, it's, it, it's really hard to get to that level. And if you try to sort of extrapolate how much data you need to get to that level by sort of seeing how the performance improves as you increase the amount of data, it's basically impractical. So we have to find new ways of training those systems. And I think self-supervised learning is part of the answer. Um, we'll see. Okay. Um, you know, it's, it, it's a hard problem. You can over-engineer it. Uh, you can add sensors that make the processing easier. You can do detailed maps. You can do all kinds of stuff to kind of make it practical in some conditions. Uh, but fully sort of level five autonomous driving is, uh, is hard. Thank you very much. Okay. With that, I know many of you have other conference events to go to. Now we're done with the last question. So I would really like to thank uh, Jan and Jeff once again for a most memorable Turing lecture. Thank you. And enjoy the rest of the conference, including the events that you have this evening. Good. Thank you.